Um, but in the time that uh, I have, I will try as much as I can to give you a lot of information, and there is a lot of good information actually. So what we're gonna do is, first I'm gonna introduce myself, and I'm gonna tell you a bit about my story and my life story, and how I ended up doing what I'm doing today and why. After that, I'm gonna talk about my organization, uh, Together Dogs for Each Other organization. It's an Arabic Israeli organization. You understand a bit more how this organization, what is the way. And then we're gonna talk about a very big issue that not a lot of people talk about, which is the Arab Israeli Israeli issue. Okay. Um, and after that, obviously, we'll also talk about the Palestinian Israeli conflict. And maybe I will show you for the first time, for some of you at least, a lot of videos and images that you will for the first time in your life. You can see it because Social media or the media in general here in the States or in Arabic uh, media will not show you this because it doesn't really serve the anti Israeli propaganda. Okay? So, my name is Yusuf Haddad and I was born in the city of Haifa. Haifa is the biggest mixed city in Israel where you have Jews, Druze, Arab, Christian, and Muslim. And you will understand in a bit why exactly I'm telling you this little about me. Later, I moved to Nazareth with my family. And through my whole life, I was actually in Nazareth, the biggest Arabic city in Israel. Christian and Muslim, majority of Muslim, about 50,000 people over there, 25,000 uh, Christians. And near Nazareth, you have uh, Nazareth elite, you have for instance, Yigdala Emek, Afula, and back then, no traffic, within 20, 25 minutes, we arrived also to Haifa. And we found ourselves, Jewish people, Christian, Muslim, Druze, together, friends. And we used to play football. What do you call it, soccer? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know, we call it football because it's we played with our foot. <laughs> but you're watching. American logic, I'm not gonna interfere. Uh, anyway. So we used to play soccer, and that, that's, that was the uh, thing that united us, and it's the common thing between us. But you know, besides soccer, what was the other thing that was common between all of us? The Jews, the Druze, the Christian, and the Muslim? We're all here. There you go. Boom. We were all Israeli. Okay? And for us, as kids, we didn't really care about politics or uh, race or whatever. You know, when we used to play uh, football together and we had a mixed team, uh, I wasn't with the ball and I didn't like think, oh wait, he's a Jewish, I'm not gonna pass him, I'm gonna pass the ball to my Christian friend. We didn't really have this. And that's how we grew up, exactly like this. And when you reach at the age of 18 in Israel, what happens? You go to the army, but not everybody, right? Only the Jewish people and the Druze men are obligated to serve in the army. Now, if you don't really know, uh, uh, you know what is the Druze community, so the Druze community were separated from the Islam, and right now they are their own uh, sector. And actually, around the world, there is just a little bit, then like around a million Druze, and in Israel there are 145,000 uh, Druze. Uh, uh, and they are well integrated in the Israeli society. And as I said, the men, they serve in the, the IDF, and in fact, get this, their percentage of serving in the IDF is even higher than the Jews. Okay? That is amazing. So, I don't have to serve in the army, although I'm Israeli, because I'm an Arab. It's not obligatory for me. And I asked myself, why? Now I know the answer, but still, I wanted to ask why, eventually, with all Israelis. So I decided to volunteer to the army. And not only I volunteered to the army, but I went to the best brigade in the IDF, Kulani Brigade. And I was a fighter, a combat fighter. But it wasn't so easy, right? Because I had to call the recruiting officer and I told him, Hi, my name is Yusuf Haddad and I'm going to join the army. But I have 
uh, it's not actually even a request, a demand. I want to be in Golani Brigade. <laughs> the recruiting officer is like, so this is not a grocery shop, you can ask what you want. <laughs> and I told him, I don't have to serve. I can just go and travel in South America. But after, like, <laughs> but after a few days, they called me and said, if you pass all the exams, no worries, you're in Golani. And if you ask me why I picked Golani, one, as I said, it's the best brigade in the IDF. And second, until some people think that I'm crazy, maybe it's right, I don't know, but that's it. And I started my service in the IDF. Now, I was very sure of this, um, of my decision to serve in the IDF. But just before I started my service, which was, I started at the, third, at the fourth, or, sorry, at the third of November 2002. One month before, I was reassured again. Because unfortunately, a terrible event happened in Israel at the 4th of October 2002. A few years ago, I went to the Maxim restaurant in Haifa and no others. Ended up killing 17 innocent civilians, injuring about 40. And guys, out of the 17, four Israeli armies. I understood that terrorism doesn't really separate between Arabs or Jews. As long as you're Israeli, you are a target. I started my service, and I can tell you that I was also one of the few Arab IDF soldiers who become a commander. And I'm gonna say it as simple as it is because Next time when someone comes to you and says Israel is an apartheid country, I want you to say to them, oh guess what, I met this Arab dude, <laughs> he was an IDF soldier, and he was a commander on a Jewish soldiers in the IDF. As simple as that. And I'm saying it this way because a lot of people don't really understand or know about the Arab society that lives in Israel, okay? So as I said, I start my service, and I become a commander, and then just one, two months before I was supposed to, um, I was supposed to finish my service, I participated in the Second Lebanon War. <clears throat> two days before ceasefire, I was badly injured. We were on our way to the shelter when Hezbollah ambush spotted us and they decided to launch a rocket towards me. Lucky for me, it didn't really hit me, but it bypassed me and it hit a wall very close to me. From the explosion, I flew in the air, ended up lying on my belly, and I just stood that I was injured. I want you to imagine this, okay? I'm lying on my bed, suffocating with my own blood, and I feel the pain. I'm in the battle. And what was the first thought in my head? Oh my God, what I am going to tell my mom. <laughs> and I'm going to imagine here telling, I told you not to get injured. But then I turn on my back and I understand that my foot was cut off. So I start shouting, my foot was cut off, my foot was cut off. They evacuated me to a shelter, a hole close in the village of Benjibel in Lebanon. And they started rescuing me. And, and, and I, we understood because I'm losing a lot of power. We understood that I have about between 20 to 30 minutes to live. Otherwise, if they don't evacuate me, rescue me as soon as possible to the hospital in Israel, I'm done. You know, a spoiler, I'm here. So they evacuated me and they rescued me. I came, I went to Nairobi Hospital and, um, and took care of everything. Um, and in that one year of rehabilitation, it was another battle for me. And during that one year, the doctor would come to me and say, Yusuf, listen, you've done amazing. You managed to reattach your foot. Everything is, looks good. And we believe that eventually, when you finish your rehabilitation, you will be able to walk, up, walk but you will walk like this. Let and then he said, which is a great achievement. You didn't have a foot two minutes ago. I looked at the doctor and I said, 
I'm going to play soccer again. He says, listen, the higher the expectation, the bigger the disappointment. I don't want to say I told you so. This is what we say. He says, Doctor, I'm going to go play soccer after the habitation. One year later, exactly. Last review at his office. I go to his office with a football in my hand like this. And I start jumping it. My leg. He looked at me. Do you want to know what he told me? Ah, I only said that to motivate you. <laughs> so at the same time, I didn't know if I wanted to curse him or hug him. So I did both at the same time. And I did overcome this injury and decided to just live again and travel the world. I can tell you that within the years after my injury, I went to Canada, managed to open a successful business over there, came back, studied political science, um, uh, uh, started my way in a marketing research company. When I ended up in the last uh, uh, position as a CEO of a company, um, under my management, over 2,000 employers, most of them are Jews. And I'm saying that again like this, because I want everybody to know that the Israeli Arabs can be successful, and they are successful, by the way, because a lot of Israeli Arabs are successful, and not like, for instance, the BDS claim on his website, if you go to the website and say that we are living under apartheid regime. Okay? So, two years ago, I decided to quit my amazing job with the amazing salary because I felt I felt something is wrong. And I felt that my society is going backward. Um, I should say that during all this time, until two years ago, I always volunteered to do stuff for my society, to do stuff for Israel. And I should also say that Israel never left me through the whole injury. I always was taken care of, good, taken care of well. I mean, it was amazing, okay? But I said I want to do more. So I decided to quit my job, and that's when I founded the organization Together Vouch for Each Other. So, this is the part where I actually introduce you to the organization, the Arab-Israeli organization that called Together Vouch for Each Other. Our main goal is to bring the Arab sector closer to the Israeli society, to be integrated in the Israeli society. We believe in something that we call the national service. National service is it's something similar to when you serve in the IDF, but if you don't serve in the IDF, you have a possibility to volunteer and serve in the national services, which is hospitals, uh, uh, police departments, fire departments, um, schools, and it counts as serving your country while at the same time serving your community, which is an amazing solution for the Israeli Arabs to serve the country, but stay in the community and serve the community as well. We want to treat our main problems like violence, alien weapons, better for structures, and we want also better education. And in a few minutes, because I'm already thinking, so wait, you don't have all this, and the reason is why? Is it because of the country, or is it because of the leaders, the Arab leaders, or is it combined? I will answer this, and you will be shocked by the answer, first of all, and by the some of the information that I'm going to give you guys. One last thing that we do is what I'm doing right here. Coming here and speak in front of you guys, and in front of other students, and other communities, Muslim, Christians, it doesn't matter, Jewish also. And we do it because we believe, as minorities, we can affect more, and I'm saying it as simple as that, more than when someone was Jewish speaking. And I'm going to give you a crazy example. In January, last January, I was at Harvard University. Um, so I went to the professor and I asked the professor, please, don't introduce me. Don't say anything about it. Don't say my name. Say I'm from Israel. That's it. Nothing else. And in my mind, I had an idea. And I knew it would happen eventually. And it did happen. Because I spoke for about 25 minutes. 
And after 25 minutes, the thing that I thought would happen, happened. When a student stand up and he said, it's obvious that you defend Israel like this. It's obvious that you talk about Israel like this. As a Jewish, I expect you to do that. I promise you guys, with my most Arabic accent, I said, my name is Yusuf Haddad, and I'm an Israeli army. You kind of, you know, throw a feather, and you will hear it on the floor. And after five seconds, the commotion was so loud. I mean, everybody was talking, and suddenly they understood. Everything I said took a different point of view because it came from an Arab, not from a Jewish. And it was so good to see them suddenly no shot. And this is exactly what we do also. Okay? And now I'm going to show you some amazing things that we did in the last two years in our society in terms of reaching between the gaps between Jews and Arabs. And now we're going to the third subject, which is the Israeli, the Arab Israeli issue. And I can tell you from now, most of it, most of this issue, it comes from ignorance. Lack of information about both of the sectors. You want a crazy example? I went to talk to a pre military school. Okay? So, I went to talk to a pre military school. And as I'm coming, this kid, Jewish obviously, he was before military, before his service, he came to me and he told me, I know who you are, I, I read about you. Okay? And I just want to tell you one thing. For me, you're a terrorist. For me, good Arab is a dead Arab. It gets better. I shook his hand and he said, thank you for telling me your thoughts. Sit down, let's talk after 40 minutes. I, got, I finished my, my lecture. He came to me after that shook my hand again and said, I'm sorry. I spoke out of ignorance. I spoke without not having the information, the right information. Guess what? Today is an activist in my organization. Now wait. On the other side, I went to speak in an Arabic high school in Nazareth. As I approached, some kid came to me. He said, you're a traitor. The Jews don't really want us. I asked him a question. Do you have a Jewish friend? He said, no. No, we don't. I don't. He said, have you, have you been in contact with Jewish side asking uh, for direction or uh, getting, uh, I don't know, clothes from the store in H&M or whatever? He said, no, no. I said, sit down. Let's talk after 40 minutes. After 40 minutes, he approached to me. And he said, OK, I understand what you're talking about. Guess what? Today is an activist in my organization. Two months ago, we did a toast with all the activists. And I shared this story with everyone. After that, we did some activity. Immediately, both of them came and paired together to do the activity. So watch this. A simple, simple, simple example. An extreme opinion from here. An extreme opinion from here. Just because they got the right information, Suddenly they're pairing and working together. That's the whole story of the issue of the Israeli Arab Israeli issue. That's it. When you grow up in Israel, you have said most of the schools are separate, which is okay. Which means the Arab learn in, in Arab schools. And because obviously we want to talk our mother tongue language. And the Jewish people will learn in a Jewish school and speak Hebrew. That's fine. But we want, after school activity, we have this, but not much. A lot of Arab grow up until the age of 18 and 20 and never have a Jewish friend or talk to a Jewish, besides like, as I said, maybe meet in McDonald's and order something and that's it. 
same obviously for Arabs or Jewish. Okay? So this simple example manages to give me the thought that we can do it. And we can do it because, get this, for instance, for the first time, we managed to help a memorial day in the Arab society to come and speak with Christians, Muslims, and Jews about the Holocaust. Not being afraid to talk about it. It was so good. So good. Next year, we already booked for 100 kids. Here, we were about 30. For the next event, for the next year, 100 kids already, kids already signed up to this event. We participated as the biggest group in anti-Semitism protest. We went there because we wanted to show everyone that we are against anti-Semitism. Because we believe if we stand against anti-Semitism, everybody will stand against racism. That's it. That's how it works. And we do a lot more activities in between Arabs and Jewish. Now, if we break it down, okay, there's about 1.9 million minorities, 1.5 million Muslims, one, uh, around 145,000 Jews, 145,000 um, uh, Christians, and 130,000 Bedouin. Now, the Bedouin are Muslims, but they are a tribe. Most of them are in the south. And by the way, a lot of them also go to the army. Okay? And the fact that we don't share this knowledge and information, and the fact that we really don't try after activities of school to live together, that's a big problem. But where can you see this coexisting? In Haifa. In Haifa, the biggest mixed city in Israel. In Haifa, there is 80,000 uh, Arabs. Now get this. Half year ago, there was a big protest in Haifa. They came, raised the flag of Palestine, shouted that Israel is an uh, apartheid country, shouted anti Israeli uh, 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 songs and sentences. And someone came and took a really good photo of the protest. Okay. And what happened is that it was so good that it looked like there's thousands of people. Well, to be honest with you, there were exactly 70 people, I mean, like between 70 to 80 people. And the biggest reason of, like, why I'm telling you this, because after that, they posted it on the social media. And everybody said, this is the coexistence that you talk on Haifa? They're raising their uh, Palestinian flag? Are they really want to be integrated in the Israeli society? But guess what? I actually had the photo from up that shows only seven. I counted, I started counting heads, like, you know, and I reached about 70 something people. And he posted it back. And he showed the guys there. There's 80,000 people in, in, in Israel, in Haifa. And because of 70, you made a collective opinion. Okay? Are we good? All right, I'll keep. yeah, I need to be okay, source. All right, anyway, guys. So this is actually brings me to a really important information and issue about uh, uh, the Israeli Arabs. A lot of you guys will ask, or I'm assuming. Um, so wait, where is this voice? Where is this voice that the Israeli Arabs? Okay wants to be part of the Israeli society, wants to be integrated in the Israeli society. I can tell you that there is a lot of them, probably the majority, but it, it's, a si it's a silent majority. And the reason why they are silent is just because they're afraid. Take a look at the example. Every day I woke up, every day I open my phone, Every day I get threat messages. Every day. Two months ago, a letter was sent to my house. Stop doing what you're doing or we will kill you. Before that, the police 
with can with come scan my car to see if there is no bombs because of this extremist that they don't like what I'm doing. I have a Facebook page over 10,000 followers. It's about like 3,000, 4,000 4, 4, Arab follow me and the rest 6,000 Jews. When I upload a post, most of the good comments and the support comments comes from Jews, from Jewish people. Even almost all of it. And I like it, and I appreciate that, and I love it. And at some point, the Jews start asking me, I don't understand. You're talking about coexistence, you're talking about we should bring the gaps, you're talking about great things. Where are the Arabs? Not even a single comment. We are the only ones who are supporting you. All the comments from the Arabs came to our private messages. Not from public comment. They wrote to me, continue like this. We support you. Some of them said, sorry that we don't support you in public, but you know what will happen. And I know what will happen. They will curse them, sometimes they will locate them, they will make their life is, life is miserable. So what I did is actually I took the hundred messages that I got and I posted it on my Facebook page. Obviously, I deleted the names in order for um, in order for, for, for to give them privacy. But I showed everybody they are existent, but we are silent. We are, we are afraid from that extreme voice. Positive. If you ask me why I'm not afraid, why I'm talking like this, we already established that I'm a bit crazy, right? So maybe that's why. But I also I really believe in this cause. I believe in this agenda. And I believe that those extremists don't want us to breach between the caps because it served their target, their mission, to keep the situation like this. But you know when I know that I am on the right path? It's when those extremists and those extremists work together against me. Then I know I'm on the right path, going in the right direction, guys. And when we talk about Israeli Arabs, take a look at this. How many of you know about Samar Hajjihya? Samar Hajjihya is a Muslim from the village Taim. He's the chairman of the biggest bank in Israel, Bank Lomi. A Muslim guy. I'm an owner, although I don't agree with him on a lot of issue. But he's a member of the Knesset, the parliament, the Israeli parliament. And he is anti-Israeli. Go back to his quotes, videos. And he gets paid by taxpayers, by Jewish and Arab Israelis. There was not hope. Guys, this is the national, the captain of the national soccer team. A Muslim, Mr. Abdelhoum, a president of one of the most important uh, uh, hospitals in, uh, in Israel, in Haria, where I was taking care of. But even, for instance, also George Garland, a Supreme Court judge, an Arab, Christian. You have Druze, Christian, Muslims, all of them successful. And this is like, just a few examples that I decided to give you guys. And that's the real reality about the Israeli laws. And it was very important for me to give you this, to make you understand that when someone talks about Israel being a part of country, I know that some of them are talking about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but they're also talking about the Israeli Arabs. And right now, I've proven that's just not true. You cannot become all this in an apartheid country. Okay? And more than that, it's important. Am I, by the way, if you, as I said, if you go to the BDS website, you will see that they have a specific section about the Israeli Arabs living in under occupation or and 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 under apartheid country. Okay? And that's why you should. All of us familiar with the Israeli Arab society. 
And I do believe that if we solve this problem, or if we really reach between the gaps, we can then move on to the next subject, which is the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And now I'm going to take you on this matter, I'm going to take you to what I call the public relation or the Hasbara uh, 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 war. And right now, we are losing this war. That. Okay. So before I start going inside this subject, okay, I'm going to show you a short video. This video, I did it with uh, the foreign uh, of, uh, office in Israel, okay? And it was, uh, uh, it was uh, posted on uh, a Facebook page called Israel Speaks Arab. And they shared after that the video, and because of that, over 2 million people in the Arab world watched the video. Now, I want you to think, when you watch this video, don't think like Americans. Don't think like Jewish Americans or Christian Americans. Don't. Take a look at the video from a perspective of an Arab civilian in Syria, Iraq, Lebanon. That some of them misled all the time, and suddenly they see this game. Okay? Watch this. Yet. Uh, 
שאתם מביאים מסוכן ישראל, מערב ישראל. למה מערב ישראל? תקבין שבעל ישראל. זה מובן מה. כי מסיבי, מסיבי, מסיבי. לפי כמה ימים הוא מוכשלט. ליהודו ארבע, שימו הבית. מי זה? לב, אברמלי, חיפה, וואטה. מה זה קרה? מה שזה קרה קרה שם. ואז יהודו ארבע כאילו משתמשים מהבית. ואין שום מהבית, הוא פתאום מהבית. זה פתשופו, תעל מה. هلا فيكم في سوق المصري، لهون مش بسوق واحد من كل انحاء العالم. على فكرة مش بس في واحد من انحاء العالم، كمان يهود. يهود، عرب، اجانب. بعد السؤال لا، عم شيك، احنا بنشيل المحل المحليد اللي بحكي اسمه عبد الوهاب عربي وانجليزي بنفس الوقت. كل المصري من هون. حكينا عن التعايش، مرحبا بكم في مركز التجارة الجديد في الناصرة، هون يهود وعرب بيشتغلوا مع بعض، بيشتغلوا مع بعض، بيطلعوا بشغلوا غرض مع بعض، وبيطلعوا مع بعض، هاي الناصرة، اليوم أنا وكيل سبعين بسمها في يخت عريقين زي الفتاة، معا نكمل بعضنا البعض، على فكرة